when you listen to the rhetoric of these Israeli officials, you can see that they're in this little bubble in the West, especially in the US, where they're used to preaching to the choir. But when it comes to the 85% of the world population, which is not in the West, in the global South, they're not buying this ridiculous propaganda. And as a clear example of this, the narrative that Israel has been going with on the international stage from numerous government officials is they have been arguing that South Africa is the legal arm of Hamas. I'm not joking. That's literally yeah. the line that they said. In justifying instituting proceedings, South Africa makes much of its obligations under the Genocide Convention. It seems fitting then that it be instructed to comply with those obligations itself, to end its own language of delegitimization of Israel's existence, end its support for Hamas, and use its influence with this organization so that Hamas permanently ends its campaign of genocidal terror. Multiple Israeli officials said, quote, South Africa is the legal arm of the Hamas terrorist organization. That's, I mean, that, that's genuinely an insane argument, but that's what they're trying to go with. Yeah, speaking to that bias, I saw uh, many people indicated I can't uh, that independently verify this. I haven't been up all night watching BBC, but that BBC did not air the uh, uh, South African presentation on Thursday. They did choose to air the Israeli presentation this morning. Moreover, it does feel like the biggest problem Israel has is all of these statements. It's President Prime Minister, senior officials have made on the record repeatedly, which speak to this question of intent, genocidal intent, which is usually the hardest um, aspect of this to prove. In fact, they have repeatedly made the kind of statements that you alluded to earlier, Ben, and I encourage people to listen to my radar on rising from Thursday, in which I read the full 84-page complaint and pulled the most egregious of them and just read them straight in like a five-minute monologue that you can avail yourself of if you're interested in, in kind of getting through it quickly. But in response, it seems to be, it seems like, again, just in the first 30 minutes or so that the, uh, uh, the lawyer making the case for Israel pointed to more recent statements made by Netanyahu after the ICJ petition was filed, which very much seemed at the time to be face-saving efforts to say, oh, no, 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 look, he said that he has no intent to permanently displace the population a week ago. You know, only it seems so that those statements could be deployed in the exact same way that they were being deployed uh, during the remarks this morning. One other point I, I wanted to get you to both weigh in on. It seemed like the South African petition provided a great deal of context. It went back to explaining the whole history of the occupation, starting from uh, the Nakba forward. The uh, Israeli representatives uh, this morning, the lawyers, seemed to somewhat bristle at the idea of context. And they say, well, we're going to talk about context. Why not talk about, of course, the context of October 7th, but also the context of the uh, history of Jews in the region dating back 3,000 years. As previously mentioned, the violence and the destruction in Palestine and Israel did not begin on the 7th of October 2023. The Palestinians have experienced systematic oppression and violence for the last 76 years. On 6 October 2023, and every day since October the 7th, 2023. In the Gaza Strip, at least since 2004, Israel continues to exercise control over the airspace, territorial waters, land crossing, water, electricity, and civilian infrastructure, as well as over key government functions. Entry and exit by air and sea to Gaza is strictly prohibited with Israel operating the only two crossing points. Given that continuing effective control by Israel and over the territory of Gaza, Israel is still considered by international community to be under belligerent occupation by Israel. They seemed to miss, and let me know if you disagree, they seemed to miss the point, the legal point that South African uh, lawyers were making about the context of an occupation providing certain rights and opportunities for the occupied party to resist with force. That's why the context is necessary, not to validate one group or the other's kind of historical, religious, uh, uh, scriptural claim to the region. Yeah, yeah. who's that for? Um, I'm happy to jump in on that real quick. Please, Omar. Um, I'll just say that that is absolutely part of the propaganda playbook, which is that anytime somebody references the fact that Israel is illegally occupying East Jerusalem or parts of the, or the West Bank or Gaza or whatever, there's always this retort of, 
you're denying the Jewish connection to this land, and that's anti-Semitism. That is effectively the implication. But nobody's denying the Jewish connection to the land. I mean, we all understand that there's a pretty significant Christian connection to the land. If the Vatican were to come over and occupy the West Bank mm -hmm. and say, this is ours now, everybody would say, that's batshit crazy. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this podcast or not. Oh, I hope it's Go for okay. it. Um, and it's the same, like, there is obviously a very significant Muslim connection to Jerusalem as well. If Saudi Arabia were to invade and take over Jerusalem and say, this is ours because of the Muslim connection, that would also be insane. In the same vein, there's no denying that there's a very significant historical Jewish connection to the land. Of course there is. But the idea that this gives Israel as a political entity and a state the right to come and take it over and impose apartheid there, where one group of people gets rights and another group get, does not, um, is, is just completely absurd. It's, it's an argument that makes no sense, but they're not interested in the merits of real arguments. They're interested in talking points that sound good to people who are not adequately informed to, to really catch on to what they're doing. To an average person, it may sound like, yeah, of course, denying that Jews were here is clearly anti-Semitic, and they just buy into it without really closely examining the, the, the deflections that Israel engages in. And a lot of this stuff is actually spelled out in Israeli propaganda documents of groups that talk about how to defend Israel, how to deflect from the issues that are being raised, and how to basically muddy the waters. It's a way to get people listening to immediately think, oh, historical conflict between different religious groups has been going on forever, they hate each other, and to kind of have a hands-on approach, rather than zooming in on the reality of an oppressed population and an oppressor class that is backed by the U.S. government. And if the U.S. government were to change its behavior, you can fundamentally end that injustice that is taking place on the ground and genuinely move in a direction where there is peace and justice and human rights for all. But that conversation, obviously, you don't want people to be thinking in the direction of what is practical and how to apply pressure to get there. It's much easier to just muddy the waters and have people think, oh, this is too complicated, too much hate in the world, and let's just move on and think about something else. That, I think, is what's, what's driving those those kinds of talking points. I think yeah, that's a and, really and good Brianna, point. Oh, please. Mm -hmm. and, and on that point, I, another very important detail in, 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 in regard to the illegal Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory, which is, I mean, has been recognized again and again and again and again in UN, in UN General Assembly and Security Council resolutions. I mean, even the US technically on paper has recognized that the Israeli occupation of the West Bank is illegal. And uh, and we, we should keep in mind that according to international law, Gaza is included under the larger Israel occupied Palestinian territories, which are officially known as the OPT, according to the UN. And Israel often says, well, we technically withdrew our our physical occupation and settlements from Gaza. But but still, for, for 16 years now, Israel has maintained a suffocating siege of Gaza ever since it left in scare quotes. Israel controls the airspace, the water space, the the land. It controls everything that goes in and out. There have been many reports that Israel has so-called put Gazans on a diet. This was before, by the way, the, the geno genocidal blockade, the siege that Israel has imposed since, in which top Israeli officials have admitted their goal is to prevent food and water and electricity and oil from going in. Even before that, there were many reports going back a decade that Israel was essentially trying to starve Palestinians, giving them just enough food so they don't die but so so it's not accused of genocide but also preventing them from having enough food but of all the people in the world currently suffering catastrophic hunger more than 80 percent are in gaza the situation is such that the experts are now predicting that more palestinians in gaza may die from starvation and disease than airstrikes and yet Israel continues to impede the effective delivery of humanitarian assistance to Palestinians. So all those details are absolutely important, but especially when we're talking about the ICJ, another crucial detail is that this year is the 20th anniversary of a previous ICJ ruling in 2004, in which the International Court of Justice said that Israel illegally constructed what's known as the apartheid wall in the occupied West Bank. And that was a ruling that was a, a product of a 2003 General Assembly UN resolution in which the vast majority of countries on earth condemned Israel's not only legal occupation of the West Bank, but the construction of this apartheid wall. And in 2004, at the request of the General Assembly, the International Court of Justice ruled 
that Israel's apartheid wall was illegal and needed to be destroyed. And I mentioned earlier the politicization of the court. Can you guess? There were 15 judges in that ruling. Can you guess? There was one judge that voted against the ruling and dissented. It was the United States, of course, the U.S. judge. All other 14 judges said that this was illegal. So there is a precedent of the ICJ acknowledging Israel's illegal occupation. Of course, that's a little different from the issue of genocide, but it's important to keep that historical context in mind. Yeah, I I, I cited, ended up citing that um, in my radar because it was cited in the South African brief. And I do wonder what you make of that. You seemed pessimistic before uh, that saying that based on the composition of the countries represented among the judges, you're not exactly optimistic that they're going to rule in favor of uh, South Africa. But it, there was this precedent of them having done exactly that. And is the is it more likely that the real pessimistic outcome here is that we do get a, re, a ruling in favor of uh, South Africa, but there's just no way to enforce it? Well, unfortunately, that would be the best case scenario, because if the ruling does end up going in South Africa's behavior uh, favor, then what that means is that there's going to be a UN Security Council vote to write into international law, and the US is going to veto that. I mean, it's basically guaranteed. Now, in, in the case of the 2004 ruling, I don't think it was as controversial, because like I said, even the US has endorsed previous General Assembly and Security Council resolutions acknowledging that Israel's occupation of the West Bank is illegal, or at the very least, let me, let me rephrase that. The U.S. didn't endorse them, but it, it did not veto them, right? So there have been Security Council resolutions calling for the end of Israel's illegal settlements in the West Bank. In the past, the U.S. did not veto. But in this case, I mean, obviously the pressure, uh, the, the stakes are much higher. I mean, we're talking about the, the issue of investigating Israel for genocide. And again, it simply comes down to very basic math. I mean, uh, Norman Finkelstein has been arguing the same, and I, I do agree. I don't always agree with him, but I do agree with this analysis. I mean, if you just look, for instance, so there are 15 judges and you have to, that means you, that eight judges have to rule in favor of South Africa's case. And you have members include the US, Germany, France, Australia, India, Japan, Slovakia. That's seven right there. And, I, and for political reasons, I think maybe I'm wrong. I, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I just, unfortunately, I think it is important that we have these proceedings in international law, but I, I don't I don't a, a agree with this idea, which I think is naive, that international law is completely impartial and politics doesn't play a key role. I mean, these are all major U.S. allies, and I guarantee you, behind the scenes, Washington is pressuring all of those countries to pressure their legal representative, their judge, to rule against it. So it I just mean, seems isn't like... One, it, yeah, is one mitigating factor, though, that, I mean, at this point... Given how public and egregious the crimes are, given how live streamed the nature of the siege has been, what is left of international law? What is left? Do you think there's any interest in these lawmakers and wanting to preserve the flailing integrity of their institution by not so obviously bending to political will in this moment? If the broader public and the overall majority of the world, even if it's the global south and not the north, uh, see with their own eyes that genocide is occurring, that this is one of the most, as uh, Craig Mokhyber said on this program and elsewhere, one of the most clear cut states of gen uh, cases of genocidal intent that he's ever seen in all of his years doing exactly this work at the United Nations. You know, Brianna, you could say the same thing about the United States right now, where a majority of the population, in spite of a relentless propaganda campaign by mainstream media outlets to effectively reflect Israel's narrative to the public and wall to wall solidarity with Israel across the political spectrum, in spite of that, the majority of the American public can see the reality of what is happening and wants to see a ceasefire. And yet there's still not an incentive for the government to do what it's supposed to do, for President Biden to actually take a better position on this. There is a deeply embedded, honestly, racism. There really is no other way to put it, that the lives of one set of people matters and the lives of another set of people just simply don't matter. That is that is the fundamental framework. And it is, it comes down to the fact that the United States continues to be a dominant player in world politics, immensely powerful. American policy can wreck economies or help them thrive. And that puts enormous pressure on a lot of countries to play ball. And you see that even with neighboring countries of, of Palestine and Israel that are U.S. allies who clearly hate what is happening in Gaza right now, starting with Jordan and Egypt. Those are generally countries that are on the American team, so to speak, in the region. 
they can't stand that this is allowed to happen. They see it as extremely desta destabilizing and dangerous, but even they have to restrict their criticism to uh, basically verbal pronouncements of being super upset with this, not daring to take concrete action to try to do what the Houthis in Yemen have done to try to apply real meaningful pressure on Israel to stop this. And that is simply because they're afraid of falling out of favor with the US and what that could mean. So given that fundamental dynamic that the world is still and probably always will be to some extent ruled primarily by power and not by principles, um, I think that that places enormous pressure. But ultimately, for me, there is not going to be an enforcement mechanism no matter what uh, the ICJ does at the end of the day. That we have, yeah. as long as U.S. military, diplomatic, uh, and financial support for Israel is unconditional, then Israel gets to do what it wants. And what we're, we're hoping out of this, that the best case scenario, is to increase the global isolation of the United States and Israel um, in terms of being the only ones defending Israeli occupation apartheid and this ongoing genocide right now, uh, to create a climate in which some countries might issue arrest warrants for Israeli officials. We need more of this to simply up, have that pressure gradually increase to the point to where Israel finally understands that it's in its own best interest to change behavior and to fundamentally change the way it treats Palestinians, even if, if in Israeli society they're not really viewed as fully human, to understand that there are consequences for you living out your racism as openly as you do and that you have to change behavior. And there's precedent for that, right? It was that kind of pressure that ultimately caused uh, apartheid to fall in South Africa. Go, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, just really quickly in response to your, your question about international law, I couldn't agree with you more, Brianna. I mean, if we'll see what happens with this ruling. Either way, it's going to show that international law is designed in a way that is not in any way in serving justice, that is completely unjust and is biased in the interest of the Western colonial powers that designed this so-called beloved rules-based international order in which they make the rules and order everyone around. So even mm -hmm. if the judges, even if I'm wrong and the judges rule in support of South Africa's case, the U.S. will almost certainly will veto the U.N. Security Council resolution. But I mean, I do agree with your points, Brianna, but you also have to say, well, the U.S. on three occasions since October has vetoed Security Council resolutions calling for humanitarian ceasefires, or even in one case, Brazil introduced a resolution that all it called for was a humanitarian pause. It didn't call for a ceasefire. It didn't call for a truce, a temporary humanitarian pause. And the U.S. vetoed it. It was the only country that vetoed it. The U.K. abstained on behalf of Israel. So I do agree with you that it, you know, the ICJ, it's not only ruling right now on this case involving Israel. It's really determining the future of these international legal institutions and showing if they truly are legitimate or not. But I think the U.S. has already shown through these, this constant obstructionism in the Security Council despite the fact that in the General Assembly, over 90% of the world's population keeps voting again and again and again and again to condemn Israel, and the U.S. and a small handful of allies and puppet regimes vote in support of Israel. I mean, for me, that alone has already done enough to delegitimize the international legal institutions. Yeah. Well, I think all that you both have said about how easy it is for the United States and the West to undermine our international legal framework, how what a, what a paper tiger that framework is in the first instance, is why people have been so, I think, encouraged, excited by, stunned by the choice of Yemen to enforce what the Genocide Convention is supposed to require all member, all signatories to do, which is to do everything in its power to stop genocide from happening. Obviously, I'm alluding to the blockade that's now been going on for weeks. And of course, to uh, the choice of United States to unilaterally and without congressional approval, start to bomb Yemen uh, to end said blockade. Who wants to to take this on? Can you give us first a, pr a brief um, gloss of what's been going on with the blockade? Sure. Um, in, in terms of, I mean, just a little bit of history there, I think is, is going to be useful just to kind Please. of set the scene. To talk just about the blockade of Gaza first, it started back in 2006 and or 2007, and they were initially very restrictive. They were blocking a quite wide variety of food items from being allowed into Gaza um, to, quote unquote, put Palestinians on a diet to control the caloric intake of, of, of Palestinians. And there were obviously the 
world was outraged, with the exception you would not notice if you were living in the United States and a few other mm-hmm. places. Um, in 2010, after a few years of that suffocating blockade being imposed on Gaza, um, there was an effort by humanitarian activists to break that blockade and deliver food and medicine to Gaza. And uh, the leading ship of that, they departed from Turkey, heading towards Gaza. Um, the Mavi Marmara was the primary ship in that flotilla at the very, very front. And before they even reached territorial waters that would be, in theory, Gaza's or even Israel's, in international waters, Israeli commandos boarded that ship and killed nine people on that first ship. And one of them was an American citizen. And Mm. nobody in the world moved a finger. There was this acceptance of the fact that Israel is imposing, obviously, an illegal blockade, obviously one that is intended specifically to harm civilians. That is the intention of it, the stated intention of it. Um, And we take that as accepted because somehow Israel is a country that is above the rules and above law, and they can do whatever they want. And now you have, by contrast, what the Houthis in Yemen are doing, which is They can't impose a complete siege on Israel by any stretch of the imagination. They only control one tiny part of what Israel has access to. The Mediterranean is still open. Land borders are still open. And they're saying to do our small part in stopping the genocide that is unfolding in Gaza, we're going to say that no ships that are bound to Israel can pass through here um, where they are at Bab el Mandeb. I've learned the name in Arabic. I don't know if it's called a different thing in English. Um, uh, Yeah, Bab el Mandeb Strait. Yeah. And... um, They basically are being very clear about the fact that they're exclusively targeting ships that are heading towards Israel. They've used non-lethal force to board ships to find out where they're headed. Again, in a world in which there is nothing happening and then some country decides to do this, you can say, hey, what are you doing? But in the midst of a genocide where countries do have the obligation actually to do everything they can to stop a crime of this scale, you could not make a better moral case for a blockade ever, if there is one, than this one. And you have the immediate reaction from the United States saying that you're going to face the might of the US military for pursuing that policy. And a lot of people have this mentality of saying, why does the US get to play world cop? Why do they think they get to you know, try to enforce the rules? Even that is a bad analogy because cops at least pretend to try to enforce the rules equally on everyone. They're there to police everything. But the US position is basically closer to that of a mobster, saying our friends get to impose whatever blockades they want. They get to carry out whatever crimes against civilians that they want. And we're there to shield them and arm them and make sure nobody interferes. And you, if you interfere in a far lower degree, in a less, less lethal way, um, in, in a more considerate way, Just because you're not on our team, we say you don't get to do this, only we get to do this, and then we're going to actually mobilize against you and kill you. That is not the behavior of a moral country, and that, again, can only be sold to people if you fundamentally see yourself as superior to the people on the other side of this. You genuinely believe that, yes, of course, we get to impose rules and not. And if anybody else, we go to their part of the world and we say, we're the ones who make the rules here, not you. And people accept that as okay. It's just, it's it's complete and total nudity. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.